chapter 15, Luke 15. We've been in our series. This will be our last sermon in this series called Lost and Found. Lost and Found. It is a, a, a unique chapter. Uh, Jesus was really a street preacher. I don't know really other any way to say it. He had no uh, base of church to preach out of. He would go from town to town. Uh, when it became Sabbath, he would, he would speak from the synagogue. He would go there and they would allow him that opportunity. But he, he wasn't a one-day-a-week preacher. He was out there every day seeking to, to minister to people in the circumstances of life. So on this particular day that these three parables were given, uh, we see the framework around it in verse 1. It said, all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. People who are in need will seek out the one who can help. And, and that's who Christ was. He is the one who can make a difference. He's the one who, he's the only one who can change lives. I, I tell everybody I can speak to ears, but he's the only one who can change hearts. And, and he would, because there was so much, there was something inside him that was so different. We, we need something that's not like us. We need something that's like the Lord Savior. People are drawn to God. Amen? I mean, all over the world, didn't really matter the country, doesn't really matter the heritage, it doesn't matter the culture, they all are drawn to God. We all have a need for God. And it, the thing that is unique about these three parables, this story, is that the ones that you would think everyone would celebrate who, who really did stand in need, they were classified as tax collectors and sinners. Well, as far as I know, we're all sinners in need of a Savior. There is none righteous, no, not one. And we should all celebrate when people who are in need find the source of the answer. But it says here in verse 2, the Pharisees and the scribes, this is the religious crowd. This is the one who thought they had it all figured out. And if everybody else would just change and be like them, that's what they thought. Everybody else has got the problem. They didn't think they had a problem. Everybody else's problem. They said, this man receives sinners and even eats with them and eats with them. How dare he fellowship with such people? He needs to come and only be with us holy ones. He needs to, he needs to not be around those sinners. And if we're not careful, church, let's just be bluntly honest. If we're not careful, we will isolate. I have heard it said, and I, I agree with it, that the longer that you're a Christian, the less you'll be around people who are lo what we would classify as lost. I, I know you're around them every day. We, we, we can't help but be around people and see people and bump into the people and talk to people. We don't know their hearts. We don't know where they're at. And, and they're in need. We understand that. But, but our circle, the ones that we're drawn to, if we're not careful, the longer you're a Christian, the more that you'll be around them. If we're not careful, we'll isolate. And if we're not careful, we'll say, those people... I'm grateful that when I was one of those people, Christ came after me. When Jesus told the story of the 100 sheep, praise God for the 90 and 9, but he went after the one that was lost. Carelessly, careless living, just did what came natural to a dumb old sheep. It got him in trouble, but praise God, the good shepherd came after him. I, I'm grateful that there was the woman who had the 10 coins, but... One slipped through the cracks, so to speak. And she wasn't going to just say, well, I've got nine. No, she wanted all of them. So with great effort, with intentionality, she went after the one that was lost, and she did not stop the search until it was found. And then the story Janice told me last Sunday after the service, she said her favorite story, the story we call the prodigal son. The one who had it all at home and, and took it for granted. But because of a lack of, a lack of respect and understanding and, and really that knowing the value of life, he went to his father and said, Dad, can I have what belongs to me now? I want to go do my thing. I no longer want restraints. I want to live my life my way. 
And he did. He left his responsibilities and only cared about himself and went out there and squandered it on living that he thought he deserved. He thought it would make him happy. Be very careful because those things that we think will make us happy will take us to rock bottom. And as my friend said, rock bottom has a basement. We don't think we can get any lower, but we seem to. We don't think things could get any worse, but they seem to. And he had his aha moment. Kyle Ottoman said he came to himself. He, he had that moment where he realized, I really don't like this. And, and this is really not good. My dad's servants have it better than me. I would rather be with him. I'm out here feeding pigs. I don't like pigs. But I'd, I'm so hungry, I'd even eat what they have. And he said, I will arise and go to my father's house. Praise God for a father who was there looking. Praise God for a father that was there longing. Praise God for a father that didn't give him a lecture and said, straighten up and then I'll love you. Praise God for a father who had his arms open wide to receive him back in, to restore him. You are family. You are mine. Listen, he was always his father's son, even when he was acting stupid. Praise God he ended well. Amen? We, we need a few more of those aha moments, don't we? We need a few more of those clarity moments that this way that I'm living my life is really not what I thought it was cracked up to be. There's something better. Can y'all say better? Praise God for better? Amen. But as much as we love the story of the 90 and 9, as much as we love that that woman searched for that coin until she found it, as much as we love and quote the, the story of the prodigal who left and came home, that's really not what the parables are about. This is the picture of the father. And this one, of all the stories, means the most to me. In the church today, when I say church, I don't mean just New Holland. I mean all the believers in Christ today, where we are as a, as a collective body of believers I see a lot of the older brother. My father came back from World War II. He uh, a little messed up. Did not talk about it. He left my mom pregnant. He met my oldest brother when he came back. My brother was two years old. And he was a believer. He got saved when he was a kid. Got baptized in the creek in his overalls. His brother had to stay home because he had to have a dry pair of overalls to go home with. So his brother, they only had one pair of overalls. That's the way the story was told to me. I don't know. I don't know if the older brother went streaking while my brother was wearing his, my dad was wearing his overalls home. I don't know how that went, but. When he came home from the war, he was detached. Life had gotten in the way. He had lost the joy of the Lord. He had had some lines in the sand, what he would do and what he wouldn't do. And one thing he wasn't going to do was go back to church. Sunday morning was the time when he read the paper. He had a friend to invite him and his friend wore him down in love and he went to church and preached this sermon my dad finished well close to my heart <clears throat> my dad was the most consistent 
Christian I've ever met. But that's when I saw the product that had yielded his heart to God. Before, he was a man with baggage. What we see in this story is an older brother who went through life and life had weighed him down with a lot of baggage. A lot of baggage that God didn't want him to have. A lot of baggage that really took away his joy and his peace and his love and his understanding and his, really his value in life. Read with me. Stand with me if you would in honor of reading God's Word. We'll begin as the story turns in verse 25. Now the older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, so he called one of his servants and asked what these things meant. He said to him, your brother has come. and Because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I've been serving you. I, I never transgressed your commandments at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I may make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatty calf for him. He said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, was lost and is found. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it is the inspired, infallible, inerrant word. And I pray that we have ears to hear it today. I pray, Lord, that we will not just hear the story, but hear the truths that you have for us. So I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you will open us up, Lord, that you would speak to hearts. And Lord, in the very next moments, that you would draw us close. Father, may it, may it not be, Father forbid that we walk out of this place with baggage, but may we lay it at your feet. Lord, may we not leave this place with an uncomfortable relationship with you. But Lord, let you restore us to the joy of our salvation. Father, may we not leave with unforgiveness and anger and bitterness. Lord, it may be because of what someone else did that was wrong, but Lord, it is continuously affecting us. Lord, may the spirit of freedom come over this place today. And Lord, if there's any lost sheep in this place, Lord, may they come home. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Verse 25 says that the older son was in the field. He was a worker all the days of his life. Matter of fact, the people in the community, if you had asked them what they knew of him, they would have probably said those exact words. He's a hard, hard worker. He's faithful to his dad. He's done, he, he does what he's asked to do. He probably thought that he was the ideal son. He worked hard for the family. He worked the fields. He had a good, we would say, a good work ethic. He didn't waste his money. He probably saved every penny he ever made. He probably built more barns, nicer houses built onto the house. He probably went to the Chamber of Commerce meetings. He probably went to the school where they would have Sabbath school and give and contribute so that they could build more games and better playgrounds for the kids to play with. In many ways, you could look at this older brother and you could say he was an ideal citizen. But hold on, church, listen to me. We need to be very careful about whose standard we're following. 
There are people in this world today who think that they are living to the greatest standard of life, but they are far from God. I'm grateful for grace, and I'm grateful for mercy. Grace bestows God's best upon us, and mercy does not give us what we do deserve. Mercy allows the avenue of grace to flow. But this one probably thought he didn't need any grace. He worked hard for it. He didn't need help from anyone else. And yet, we know his life was empty. We know he had pain. He found his accomplishment in what he could do. How many people do you know like that? Is that you? I mean, you look at your life and you say, look what I've provided. I remember the, everybody told me that when my parents were gone, I would understand and stand up as a, as, as a man for the first time. I really didn't understand what that meant, but when mom and dad went to heaven, I realized it was just Lynn and I. We had a house. I worked hard to pay for it. Tried to do the best of my ability. I tried to be the good father to my children. I tried to be the good friend to everyone else around. Matter of fact, I bought into the American dream. Y'all know anybody that's tried to follow the American dream? How many people do you know of that are trying to follow the American dream but are still empty and hunting, hurting, wanting more? How many people you know that have bought houses but that wasn't enough? How many of you bought cars and it, it, it made you feel good to smell that fresh leather, that new car smell for a little while, but even that went away? You bought clothes that you thought would be the greatest thing in the world, but then those move out of season and you have to buy new. You have friends, but when do you ever get together to do things with friends? And friends change. And spouses change. And jobs change. And your health changes. Can I get an amen? amen. And churches change. And we think, where did it go? What happened? And those that are around us are hurting. And our children make mistakes. And if you're not very careful, that which God placed within you is all leaked out. And you, you say to yourself, isn't there more to life than this? And the older brother came in from the field and he heard something. He heard the music. It says... In, in, in verse 25, he heard music and dancing. Baptist, how's that make y'all feel? My dad used to say that if you tap your toe in your shoe, you're not a Baptist. That's dancing to a Baptist. I praise God that we've been freed up from that a little bit. Amen? I believe that life should be lived with the emotion of whatever God has placed before you. There's a time to laugh. Amen? We don't need to be so tied up and tight and and think that everything's so serious. I think my Lord gave us laughter we need to enjoy. But there's also a serious time too. And, and there's a time to laugh and there's a time to cry. There's a time to rejoice and there's a time to mourn. Solomon wrote that to us in Ecclesiastes. There, we, there's all the seasons, but we need to take advantage of it. We need to know those things. But, but this guy only knew one thing. He heard the other and he said, what is this? Maybe he had a little bit of excitement. Hey, has someone come? What great thing is this? So he called his servant, and they said, uh, your brother's come. Can you hear the thud? He's come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father killed the fatty calf. And something arose in the older brother. He looked at his younger brother, listen to me now, and judged him by fact rather than by grace. He was a terrible son. He asked for his inheritance ahead of time. He acted like dad was dead. And, and he left. We're supposed to be here and take care of the family. And, and I've been the only one here. He didn't care. He left. 
with all of his money. And he went out and squandered it. And he's back. And dad did what? He killed the fatty calf? He didn't deserve it. Can you, can you hear the judgmental spirit? How many of you would love for God to look, to look at you? Come on now, listen to me. How many of you would love God to look at you and judge you by what you've done against the perfect example of Christ? Can anybody in here meet the standard of Christ? I can't either. Anybody need grace? Anybody up for some mercy? Aren't we good at looking down at others? Aren't we good at saying, how dare they? Who's, who's welcome in this church? Who? Anybody? And what do we mean by welcome? Come home. Come home. Are we going to be like the father with arms stretched out? Put the best robe on him. Put the ring on his finger. He belongs. Slaves don't wear shoes. Put some sandals on his feet. We're going to celebrate. Or are we going to gossip? Are we going to stand in self-righteousness? Look down in piety? This older brother was in bondage, and I don't believe he even knew it. He was empty, and he didn't know how to feel it. Feel it. He had a works-based salvation. By the way, he really didn't have communion with his dad. He was doing it because he was supposed to, not because he wanted to. I doubt that there were many times that they came in and just shared. Unspoken love. What good is it? We say that we love. Listen, church. Do we say it? I was 40 years old before my dad ever told me he loved me. I never doubted it a day in my life. I knew my dad loved me. My dad was a preacher every day of my life. He had accepted the call way before. But unspoken love, it would have been nice. Come on, church. If he had just looked at me and said, son, I'm proud of you. I love you. Appreciate you. Grateful. Though I knew it, I think the older brother loved his dad in his way. Probably why he went to the field in his way. You know, I, I don't want anybody to spend their last days full of unforgiveness, self-righteousness, envy. I'm grateful that God does for you. But it's not a competition. If God does something for you that he doesn't do for me, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to say, amen. If someone gets something that I don't get, I'm fine with that. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I'm going to be there with you to celebrate. Selfishness. You didn't even give me a, a goat so I can celebrate with my friends. But this son of yours who wasted everything, left, went out with prostitutes. That's where he spent your money. How dare you love him? How dare you accept him back? I love verse 28 because when it says that he was angry and would not go in, therefore his father came out, listen to me now, pleaded with him. 
I think it's like he went to his son and said, son, come to the house. We're having a party. It's not the same with you not there. Dad, I'm not going. What do you mean? You're celebrating that boy. Don't you know what that son did? Oh, it's good. He was lost. Now he's found. He was dead. But now he's alive. Let's celebrate. I kind of get this picture. When it said he pleaded with him, I believe he got down on his knees. Son, please. And it did no good. John MacArthur, in his commentary on this passage, said, kind of like Paul Harvey. Y'all remember Paul Harvey? He would tell a story and then break away, and he'd come back and say the rest of the story. Paul Harvey said, or excuse me, John MacArthur said, if... um, We knew the rest of the story. If it didn't end here, if it continued on, it probably would have gone like this. Because you see, Jesus was talking to the Pharisees and the scribes. He was talking to that religious group. He said, you're talking a big game, but you're not walking it. You're not loving. You've got all this baggage of rules and regulations. Church, let's let all that go, and let's just fall in love with Christ. Let's let our heart full of love for him, lead us to that place. Those things should draw us near. What to stay away from so that it would not harm us, but what we should go to because it's what's best. John MacArthur said, if the story went on, it probably would have gone like this. The older brother got so mad and so angry at his dad that he murdered him. Kind of makes sense when you think what the Pharisees did to Jesus. How could anybody turn down such great love? How could anyone stand against the one who gave everything to make us whole and say, no, 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 I'm not going to accept that way. I'll only accept it if you come and do it my way. That's what the older brother wanted. Dad, you must do it my way. Church, are we going to do it God's way or our way? There's some things that we're going to have to do. Are we going to love? It's been... Five and a half months since I've been your pastor. How many sermons have I preached on money? I don't care about your money. Well, I get a paycheck every week, Mark. My, amen. My, my bills, I, amen. I appreciate that. I care about your love. I'm not saying you have to tie so that to prove that God loves you, but because you love you, you should say everything in your life is His. Is that not correct? We, we've been talking for four weeks about listening to God and letting God put someone on your heart and inviting them to church next week. So don't raise your hand, but how many of you invited someone to church next week? Don't do it because I told you to. Follow the love. Follow the love. Is it about us? We're too crowded anyway. We'll get there. I pray it gets a whole lot more crowded in this place. I pray that we have a whole lot more people that with baggage that will come here and find out that they can quit carrying that baggage. You can lay the baggage down. You can lay those expectations down. You can lay that emptiness down. It's like an artesian well of the Spirit of God that fills your life and overflows, and you're just living a life of gratitude. Oh, the peace and the love, the joy that God gives. Taste and see that the Lord is good. There are some that are self-righteous, and they're so happy in who they are. I'm just grateful for who Christ is. I've seen a little bit of the older brother in me, Bradley. 
I have. I'm a little bit of a control freak. I told the search team that before they called me. Here's the pastor. As a matter of fact, I believe that night that when I was answering questions, I believe I told you all that that night. I'm a little bit of a control freak. I'm a recovering control freak. I've had to apologize many times for being a control freak. There is a way that seems right under a brine, and I kind of like it. But I know that there is a way that seems right unto the Lord. And I've grown to love it. I just wonder how many people would like to have a little bit more of what God has for you. Wouldn't it have been great if the older brother said, you know what, Dad, you're a good man. I don't know that I could do that, but I love you and I respect you, and I pray that one day I can be like that too. There are times I don't like that brother of mine, but I must love him. I think I'd like to have some What is it you call calf? None of y'all know. We don't eat much. Some, some young steak, how's that? I mean, as soon as I say amen, the word will come to my mind. Veal. Why couldn't you say that 30 seconds ago? <laughs> my wife knew it. She's not going to help me out at all. Just leave me up. <laughs> Let him get up there and just... Wouldn't it have been great if the older brother said, though I don't fully understand it, I know it's the right thing to do. Lord, fill me with your love. I'm not looking for y'all to just change. When God began to do a work in me, it was a gradual work, but it was a love work. I pray every day more of him, less of me. He must increase. I must decrease. And I am learning that that's a good place to be. It's a place of kindness. It's a place of help. It's a place of growth. I wonder, do you want to rejoice today in what God has done? If you do, we can't stop you. Praise God. But Satan can. If you want to hold on to your unforgiveness, bitterness, hurt, pain, judgmental spirit, waiting for the world to change and be like you, go on with your bad self. But you're going to miss the love of God. You're not going to understand the mercy of God. And we're supposed to be Christ-like. I wonder today, does anybody want to start the walk of a wonderful, free life? Let the baggage go? I wonder if there's anybody that needs to actually give their heart and life to Christ. Y'all listen to you, Pastor. In this building, this size, this group of people, I'm not the only control freak in here. I'm not the only one that's dealing with emptiness and pain. I'm not the only one who needs to change my attitude and let go and let God. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father, may we hear your word. Maybe we be open to your work. May we embrace what you so wonderfully have for us. Thank you, Lord, for freedom. Thank you for life. Thank you for salvation, full and free. I pray, Lord, if there's someone in this building that does not know you as Savior and Lord, convict them right now. Speak to their heart right now. Lord, like you're saying to them, he's talking about you. Speak to their heart. Draw them to yourself. 
And I pray, Lord, that they have the courage and the boldness to accept you as Savior and Lord. Father, do it today. But Lord, if we've got any Pharisees and scribes, I know that we do. I was one. I was chief. Father, may we move away from all that baggage and find the new life in Christ. Lord, would you please knock off the chains, unshackle them, set us free to worship, and to sing and to dance and rejoice. Father, may New Holland Baptist Church be a place that celebrates the work that you, Jesus, do in this place and in our lives. Father, may it all be about you. May it begin and end with you. Lord, work in our lives as only you can. This invitation is yours. Use it however you see fit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.